Okay, everyone, uh, thanks for being patient. Our, our microphone situation is not great right now, but hopefully you can hear us. Um, Tao's going to begin shortly, and um, we'll start with loading a sample and then do the alignments. Okay, um, I'm going to turn it over to Tao now, and uh, thank you for joining. If you have any questions, do feel free to add them to the chat and we'll be able to see those and we can answer. Okay, great, thanks, Quentin. Um, okay, uh, Tal, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, uh, hello everybody, I'm sorry for the wait, and uh, uh, welcome to this first uh, online training on Talos. I'm going to cover the PEM alignment and the STEM alignment and all the basic operations in these two uh, modes. So um, first, uh, for the first time trainees, um, I'd like you to please uh, Type your name and uh, also the email address in the chat area so that we can uh, keep the track. Oh, it's there and. And uh, um, so um, just want to uh, clarify that uh, after this uh, tr live training session, uh, those first time trainees. Uh, will be given the uh, daytime access, and uh, uh, but they will um, they do um, require I do require um, a second time training uh, that's gonna be on your first session. So after this training, uh, you will be booking time by yourself and just uh, let me know during your first training um, uh, during the first session. And uh, we will uh, basically just uh, go over the things. And uh, for the uh, established users, um, there are no more actions required. Um, we um, we thank for um, joining us the training, but uh, it's uh, optional, and you're welcome to uh, join and uh, post questions in the chat area. Uh, so today's in today's training, I'm gonna uh, try to uh, separate into small sections, and uh, in between the sections, I'm gonna um, come over here to the chat and uh, answer the questions. So uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, type your questions uh, in in the chat area. So. Um, Okay, um, okay, so everybody now should be able to see the um, Talos uh, PC. So um, first I'm gonna just uh, introduce, introduce briefly the software uh, environment. So um, that's also if you um, pull up your SOP, that's going to be the first thing you need to check. So um, on Palos, we have uh, a few um, software that we will need. Um, So here we have this one called TEM user interface. This is its icon. It should be running. Um, all the operations are um, supported in this uh, TEM user interface. And uh, this area is uh, called FluCam. 
So Talos doesn't have a, a fluorescence a phosphor screen. So it uses this kind of uh, this camera to show whatever showing uh, on the on the screen on on those old TEMs. So um, whenever I refer flu cam, it's uh, this guy. Also, if I go over here, this software is called the T um, TM Imaging and Analysis TIA. So you will need this guy to take um, images. And uh, also, let me go to here. This software is called uh, Velox. Uh, we can use this software to take uh, stem images and uh, EDS mapping. And uh, mostly, uh, we use this software for the EDS mapping. And this, this is the only available uh, software for EDS mapping on this tool now. OK, uh, so. If every, everybody has uh, the SOP in hand, um, I'm gonna, um, I'd like everybody to take a look at your SOP for the uh, procedures one, prepare to start. So we just review the software and uh, you also wanna check a few things before you really start your session. Um, so here, you come to TM user interface and the first tab vacuum. You want to check, uh, you want to confirm uh, these numbers. So, the accelerator that's the vacuum for the gun area, it should be always one. And the column, this guy, it should be uh, less than 20. So, if it's not, just uh, let me know, there should be something wrong. The detection unit is usually around. Uh, 16 to 20 and uh, if it's uh, bigger than um, 25 uh, just let me know and one last thing is this uh, liquid nitrogen level so um, on Talos you don't have to fill the liquid nitrogen by yourself so um, I will fill the nitrogen for you but uh, when this level is uh, below 20% just uh, let me know because it's gonna show some error or the alert um, um, on this area. Um, the high tension here should be on. If it's off then something's wrong. And uh, you come to here it should set say 200 kV. That's the uh, normal condition we, we should work. So if you notice something wrong here, just uh, let me know. All right, so um, next we are, so um, next thing is the sample loading. Um, so right now on the screen, you should be able to see um, our sample holder. Uh, that is actually on the real TEM. Um, usually, see there is a door and uh, it's usually closed. So the first thing you want to do is to take this holder out. This is our single tube holder. Uh, we we usually keep this single holder here uh, when there's no one using it. Uh, so to take the holder out, if you go to uh, SOP section two, um, there are also a few things you want to check. So let's go to go back to here. I will show you what you need to check. So first, you want to check his, here this vacuum. See this um, vacuum column valve closed. So this button should be yellow. That means the column valve is closed. Make sure this column valve is closed. 
Then you come to here and see there are uh, X, Y, Z, A, B. So these are the stage positions. And make sure they are neutral. Like um, sometimes it, it can have very small values. That's uh, not a problem. And if they are not neutral, um, you can, let's see, come to here. This is, this is a touch panel on the TEM, so you can just click this, reset XYZ alphabet. That's going to reset the stage position. You, you can also find the stage positions over here. And uh, one last thing you want to check is uh, this. So come to stage apertures. You want to make sure that there is no objective aperture, also selected area aperture inserted. So they, they all uh, selected to none. OK. Um, then you come to this uh, loading sample loading port. Um, you want to click the remove sample. All right, so on this uh, touch screen, it's going to show some uh, instructions. Uh, and uh, actually, we have a video. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether it's uh, posted on our YouTube channel or not. Uh, I recorded how to remove and insert the holder. So to remove holder, let's uh, make sure you grab a pair of clean gloves. And uh, you just click the remove sample. And then you put your left hand here to hold this uh, white plate. Just hold it gently. And then you want to pull the holder out straight until it stops. OK, so let's do it. Pull it out. Now it stopped. And then you want to turn clockwise until it stops. So while you're doing this, Keep an eye on this pressure readout, um, especially the column value, because this this uh, value can change, can fluctuate a little bit. And uh, once you, if say you you just dump the vacuum, and this value will go just uh, like uh, disabled, something like that. That will tell you well something bad, wrong, something bad happened. But right now it still stays at one, so we are good. So one last step is you still put your uh, left hand here and uh, use your right hand, use your palm to grab the holder, the black piece, and uh, just use your uh, index finger to press the plate and uh, take it out gently. Right, so that is the TEM holder. So this guy is the single tube, and uh, we do have a double tube and a uh, cryo uh, and a tomography holder available on the Talos. Uh, it, so if you need uh, need to use uh, those holders, um, we can set up a training separately. Okay, um, so next you, you will need to load your sample. Um, because uh, today we didn't set up a camera over here, so I will just load your sample. And remember, you will need the second training. Um, probably we can talk about that in your second training. So <clears throat> I'll just uh, load the sample. on the single tube holder. Okay. 
sample loading is uh, actually very easy on the single tilt. Um, but uh, if you want to use the double tilt, um, there's a little trick on that. So um, again, uh, I will be showing you the sample loading on the holders uh, during your uh, next training. Um, Loading a sample on a single tube is very easy. So if you are the first time training, and uh, even if you need to use a double tube, I recommend you just start from the single tube and uh, practice out uh, everything. <clears throat> OK. So I have loaded the sample on this holder. Uh, the sample is actually sitting over here um, in this tip. And uh, also, you see there's an o ring here. Um, sometimes, if the o ring is dirty, uh, the vacuum can be bad. So, if you ever see like any dirt and any debris on the o ring, you, just, you can just wipe it out with a uh, with a gloved hand, fingers. Do not touch it with bare, uh, bare hand. Okay. And also do not touch the part uh, above the O-ring because this part is going to uh, stay under the high vacuum. So um, to insert the holder, let's go back to this panel. We want to click load sample. So another um, instructive uh, instructive uh, screens are gonna show up. There are some instructions uh, you can read. Um, but uh, basically, I, I will show you how to do that. So first, you wanna find um, see there's a pin over here. I don't know if uh, you can see it clearly. There's a pin over here, and uh, there is a marker on the on the um, on the port, like to the five o'clock direction. So you want to align this pin to this marker and insert it straightly. So we do it like this. Insert it straightly. So at the end of this. Uh, at, the, at the end of this um, insertion, you, you're going to feel uh, the O-ring is uh, getting in touch with the, the, the metal part like down there. So it's going gonna, it's gonna to feel differently. Uh, so imagine like you have a soft rubber contacting with the metal. So it's very important that you feel that if you, you don't have a feeling of that contact, there is a highly chance that the holder is not at its uh, right position, then you're going to dump the vacuum. Um, so right now, it's um, the, you probably you can hear the sound. If, you, if not, it doesn't matter. The pump just started. So it's going to pump out the sample loading chamber. And on this touch screen, there is a holder insertion dialog. So there are only two, single tube and double tube. Uh, now we're using single tube. You can just select the single tube and uh, click select. If uh, for some reason you have selected the wrong type here, uh, unfortunately, there is no way to correct that. You have to wait for the pumping time and then take it out insert it again and select the, the right type. Um, I know probably this uh, video, in this video you cannot see uh, like the marker and the pin 
explain those small things very clearly. Uh, don't worry, uh, we can also cover that uh, in our second training. So the countdown time is uh, three minutes. Um, you, uh, do not try to change that number, change that time. So you can just uh, wait here for three minutes and let it finish counting. All right, so um, I didn't see any anybody um, in the chat area um, post, posting their names and email address. So again, if you are the first time trainees, um, please uh, type your name and the email address in the live chat area so that we can uh, keep your training history and uh, we can give you the daytime, daytime access after this training. Okay, it looks like the, the pumping is done and uh, here So on this touch screen, uh, you will see the it says click next to proceed. So click next. There are gonna be some uh, instructions. Uh, so basically, if you look at here, this light it just went off. Uh, that's an indicator of the pumping cycle is finished. So now it's uh, you're ready to just insert the holder. So to insert the holder, use your um, left hand. So again, to, to hold this plate and use your right hand. This time you wanna turn it counterclockwise until it stops. Then once it goes to that position, the vacuum is gonna pull the holder in. So you, this time you don't want to you don't want holder to be going in too fast. You want to hold the holder a little bit and let it in slowly until it goes in completely. So final step, you want to tap this holder a little bit. That can, can help release any unstable positions and uh, get rid of the uh, sample drift. All right. so. Last step, just click down. So the touch uh, panel uh, goes to the this screen. It basically shows the information. And you can take a look at the column. Now it shows two log. That's great um, because if anything bad happened, like if you dump the vacuum, that number will go crazy. OK. All right, great. So now I saw um, some names appearing in the chat. So I will, uh, well, thank you. I will um, keep your track and uh, give you the access later. So let's come back to come back to the TEM uh, uh, TEM PC. So while you are loading the sample, the VLOX will pop up this window. Uh, this is a new feature in the, uh, in the new versions. So actually here, um, you can see the auto save pass. The default, I just set it to Z drive and VLOX auto save. But now you are allowed to change this one to um, like your folder. So on on this uh, TEM uh, PC, there there are uh, like three um, local drives, but all the data is saved in this net network local drive uh, that says user data. So 
try to save all your data here and uh, you can create a, a folder for your name for example today we're gonna create a folder called training so if you select this folder see the auto save pass is changed to Z drive training uh, so all the data collected by the VLOX is gonna be automatically saved into this folder and you can also like check this date it's gonna create a folder uh, with this date and you can also check this experimental experiment name just give it a name you like probably for example today I'm I'm using the gold nanoparticles so I will just name it AUMPS and uh, of course there are some other customizations you can do but uh, I will usually just change this and please click close all right so later any data collected by the VLOX is gonna be saved in that folder okay so let's come back to the TEM user interface so uh, on our Talos um, again we have TEM mode we have STEM mode and uh, it's not like like the like uh, say JUL 3100 while you you switch to uh, TEM from ST, STEM then your alignments gonna be uh, messed up on um, this tool um, there are still a little bit hysteresis but mostly uh, you are free to switch over between different modes um, and that means um, you you are free to just you know use TEM for some imaging or diffraction patterns and switch back to STEM do some do some STEM imaging and EDS mapping and then switch back to TEM and uh, things like that uh, but today um, we we will just uh, start with a uh, TEM mode so to start with TEM let's go to this fag tab and come back come to here say the FEG registers so FEG registers mean um, just alignment like alignment settings they can be saved as files uh, for example if you click this little triangle in the flap out you will see right now you're reading the file name we are reading is the tm.feg so that's uh, the alignment files I am maintaining every time when I use this microscope I'm gonna um, update these items and save in this file so um, of course you can you can just do your own alignment but I recommend you use the you start from the the items that is saved in my alignment that will give you a good start so sometimes you see this one is not um, my it's not my fag, fag register it's, it can be someone else so you just click open so in this dialog you can find um, tm.feg and open so in here there are um, a few things so mostly uh, we use 200 kV tm for the tm mode and in STEM mode there are a couple of different items we, we will talk about that later so if we want to start with TEM we just select this 200 kV TEM and click set once you do that you will hear um, some sound from uh, the microscope and it will show it's uh, setting up um, a lot of things to switch the mode and now you see here it says TEM bright field this is the magnification so right now we are in the TEM mode 
then uh, let's go back to the vacuum and uh, double check the column value now it's one so whenever this number is below 10 uh, you are safe to open this column valve so let's just open it all right now uh, the beam is open the next thing we will need to find the beam so we come to come back to the uh, flu cam so again this is uh, equivalent to the phosphor screen uh, we used to use on uh, like uh, 2010 uh, 2100 and uh, 3100 but right now everything is uh, digitized so first thing this is the same we, we want to find the beam so to find the beam sometimes when right after you open the column you will see the beam here but um, most of the time you don't see the beam here um, that's not a problem so you want to find the beam so here this this knob on the right hand panel is the it says magnification so you can turn the magnification down you can see this number is decreasing so while you decrease the mag you should be able to see something on the screen right and uh, see because this is a like a, this is a TEM grid so um, like if you are you are unlucky you are on the grid bar you probably won't see the beam then you you have to move your sample a little bit so this is your sample all right on the okay so next um let's take take a look at the hand panels this hand panel uh is different than uh any panels that are on the joe microscope um but you will you will find uh, a lot of similar things like this knob is is said uh, it's called the intensity so it's just like the brightness knob on the JUL so you can change the intensity using this knob so you can like um, converge the beam and spread it out like that all right and uh, you 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 find a trackball here on the JUL you use trackball to move the sample but here it's not this trackball is for the beam shift so see I I am using the trackball to move the beam um, sample if you want to move sample it's this joystick so you use that the sample will move okay and uh, probably you noticed uh, there are a couple of plus minus buttons one set here one set here one set here um, so not like uh, the GUL it just has coarse and fine button on um, on the FEI tools you uh, you are not limited to just uh, two steps like coarse and fine there are uh, a few a few more steps so it the the step size is controlled by this plus and the minus button so let me show you if i converge the beam and uh, i can move my beam at this speed if i click plus button two times you see now I am able to move it faster and if I click the minus button a few times now I can move it slower things like that so this set is only working on the the trackball and this set over here works on the multi-function these two knobs and these two set works on the joystick that's the sample movement and also the Z Z button 
the z z height button is over here. All right, so that's an overview of the panel. And uh, now, so if you go to the SOP um, blah blah blah, then we we are now at uh, three point two TEM alignment. Um, so it says load two hundred kV TEM alignment. That's uh, what we just did. We click this and set. Now we're in TEM mode, and then we will need to find the eucentric height. So from here, we are really going into the alignment procedures. Uh, to find the eucentric height, um, probably the the easiest easiest uh, way is to just convert your beam using this intensity knob convert your beam into a spot then if you look at if you take a look at the full cam you are going to see a few rings like um other than other than just this uh, converged beam you you can see a lot of rings if you don't let's uh, left click the flu cam and use the wheel mouse wheel to change uh, the contrast now you can see the rings clearly so the good thing for the flu cam is it's digitized you can change this um, brightness contrast digitally without changing uh, without changing the beam intensity so it's a uh, it's more convenient than just uh, sitting in the dark room and uh, trying to see clearly what's showing on the phosphor screen okay so now you see the rings and uh, let's go ahead and click this eucentric focus button on the right hand panel so just click it it's gonna reset the defocus. So right now, if you take a look at this defocus value, it's at, it uh, it's reset to zero nanometer. And now, while you you're watching the rings, let's change the z height, the z button over here. The goal is to get rid of the rings. So see, I'm uh, going down and the rings are shrinking to the center and finally it's gonna they are all gonna disappear leaving only this uh, uh, converged beam on the screen so let's change it back to natural because we just uh, we just use the mouse wheel to change the uh, brightness whenever we do that it will switch to the manual mode and if we go back to natural, this is kind of uh, automatic mode. The software automatically changes the brightness and contrast for you. All right. So then, um, to get um, to get a more precise uh, alignment of the z height, you can see you can zoom in a little bit like this. So right now. Uh, other than just a small converged beam, you can you actually see a lot of a lot more details. And if you uh, change the intensity to converge it more, there are still the diff, uh, like these rings. So you can just fine tune the Z button to make it like this. So now it's all done. That is the eucentric height. So now let's spread out the beam. Um, so next, 3.2.3, it says condenser aperture alignment. So let's zoom out a little bit. For the condenser alignment, you want to use the intensity to Converge the beam 
like that and uh, then use the trackball to move the beam to the center spot um, you see on the screen there's a marker for the center so move your beam on the center and then um, spread out the beam okay like that and now you can compare the beam with uh, the this screen marker this circle is concentric to the screen center and uh, our goal is to make the beam concentric so right now actually it looks good uh, let's go to the stage so you can see you can find the apertures condenser tool um, and there's the adjust button you can click the adjust button so um, I was saying this is this is good I can mess it up like that so this is not good so if you ever see anything like this then that tells you that you need to align the condenser lens aperture so like if you convert beam the beam is uh, will still stay at the center of the screen but if you spread out the beam you see now the beam is not concentric at the screen at the screen center so you can click the adjust and now use the multi-function XY to move this aperture so something like that you can move left and right you can move up and down so the goal is to move your beam or move the aperture right at the screen center like that and you can double check it a few times so converge it move it to the center spread it out see uh, now it's uh, right at the screen center so we are happy with that so I'll call it down the condenser aperture alignment is done and uh, by the way uh, under apertures we have actually two condenser lenses condenser 1 condenser 2 so never touch the condenser 1 um, the condenser 1 is always set to 2000 you don't you don't right now uh, you don't have to touch uh, change anything on the condenser 1 and on the condenser 2, there are four different apertures. Uh, you see in this uh, drop down box, you, you can see 150, 70, 50, and 20. Usually, if, you're, if your sample is not that beam sensitive, you can just use 150 for the TEM mode. In STEM mode, we're going to change that later. But in the STEM mode, uh, in the TEM mode, uh, we usually use 150 but if you want to uh, like get a weaker beam uh, you can use 70 um, 50 and 20 are seldom used in the TEM mode so let's just use the 150 and we just did the condenser lens after alignment so let's move forward the next item on the SOP is the condenser lens astigmatism. So it says you want to zoom in to at least um, 120kx or higher. So something like that. Now I am at uh, 150. And you want to convert your beam and see if the beam is uh is uh, round or not so actually this beam is uh, it looks okay um let's go to the stigmator i can show you um what is bad what is good what is bad so right now it looks very um circular let's go to stigmator and click the condenser and uh, Let's mess it up. You see, now the beam is kind of oval shape, and if if you go across the uh, crossover, it 
it changes the shape something like that so that tells you there is a condenser lens astigmatism then to fix this you want to go to the stigmator so you come here select stigmator and uh, click the condenser um, wait I think this is blocked by the hand panel all right so now you see you can go here and select stick mater. so now this is the stick mater. um select you can select condenser and use multifunction xy knob to fix that okay so you want to make that as as round as possible okay so something like that maybe just a little bit okay and in the stigmator you can see there are actually three channels so it's good that um, you can actually save three different settings like especially for the first time trainings for the beginners if you are not sure um, which way you want to go you can like here now the first column is selected you can right click and say copy one to two so now the 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 values in the column one is copied to column two so now you can just play with this stigmator and see how it changes. And whenever you feel like, oh, I cannot get it back, no worries. You can come to the column two, or right click column two and say copy two to one. It will bring you back to uh, where you started. So this is a very nice function and I use it, um, I use it a lot. Okay, so that's the condenser lens astigmatism. So next item, we are going to do the beam tilt pivot point. So we will go to alignment. So under alignment tab, there is a direct alignment window. There are a few items here uh, we want to do. So two point, uh, 3.2.5. Point one, it says set a magnification higher than 120k. So now we are at 150k. We are we are good. And then we want to converge the beam like that using the intensity knob. So the beam is converged. Now if you click beam to PPX. So now you see the beam is like splitting it's wobbling uh, left and right now use use the multi-function x and y you are able to change you are able to change the positions of the two splitting beam so the goal here is to make the two splitting beams overlap so for some reason the the two beams are not completely identical but you just do that uh, you try your best to make them overlap so something like that I'll say okay something like that is probably good enough and you do the same thing for the Y so why is why looks good now but if you want to play it works in that way so make the two splitting beam overlapping so that's the beam to the pivot point so when you're done click this down button over here all right so next we will go to uh, 3.2.6 beam tilt 
So for the beam tilt, um, so again we will do that at a magnification higher than 120k and you want to center the beam and use the intensity knob to spread it out. So here, if you if you have done all the previous procedures right, you should be able to see your sample. And if you like, if you are working on the like a fifth fifth section, you wanna move your sample over to the screen so that you can see it. So now you wanna move something that is uh, obvious that is di distinguishable to the screen center. So use the joystick to move your sample. Like I'm, I'm just going to use this guy, this black piece over here. So use this guy as the reference. And then you go to rotation center, which is in, which is in the direct alignment. So you click this rotation center and you see the image is uh, changing in and out of focus. Um, so yeah, actually, again, right now it's uh, pretty good, I think. But if you change the multi function x, so right now you see the that black piece we just moved to the center is moving left and right. So this is not good, and uh, the goal here is to just use the multifunction buttons, multifunction knobs to stop that movement. So like right now, it just go in and out of focus, but this black piece stays still. So again, here you can use multifunction x, y to correct that movement, like. For now, uh, I just uh, changed the multifunction x, uh, multifunction y knob. So right now the uh, sample is moving up and down. So you can, I can change the multifunction knob back until that movement stops. Okay, somewhere here. All right, so this is the rotation center. Um, next, uh, we come to the coma-free alignment, 3.2.6.2. Um, this is actually fine-tuning, the fine-tuning of the beam tilt. So what we just did, that rotation center is just uh, a rough alignment of the beam tilt. If you really want to get a perfect uh, beam tilt, uh, you want to do this uh, coma free alignment. So let's just do it. So it says set a magnification over 300k. So let's zoom in. So right now we are uh, 101kx. And then you can turn on the FFT knob over here. There's a lifetime F uh, FFT. So right now you should be able to see the FFT. Then um, if you don't see the FFT, uh, if, if you don't see the rings, you can change the focus. This is the focus knob. Change the focus to make the rings showing. Then you come to the coma free alignment. You click the alignment X. So you can see the image is wobbling. So there are two, two, two set of images. One's like this, the other one's like this. So you see two, two images are wobbling. It's actually tilting the beam. And what you want to look at is this uh, FFT. So when the image is switching, uh, between the two, you will see two set of FFT patterns, and they sh when when they are uh, very identical, that means your beam tilt is good. So just like right now, it it looks pretty good, but.
but if I change the multi function, let's, I'll mess it up. So now you see the two set of FFT patterns, one is smaller, one is big, like this. See the difference? So now let's move, move it back. So something like that. Now two sets are very identical. So this is the goal. And you can do the same thing for the Y. And you see the Y is uh, already very good. But you can also, again, use the multi function X button to X knob to mess it up. So right now, you see the difference. One is like that big. One is this small. So move it back. So something like that. Now you see this Fourier transform pattern um, doesn't change while the image is switching. So that means the coma free right now is good. All right, so one last thing for the alignment is the astigmatism, objective lens astigmatism. So don't, don't mess it up with the condenser lens uh, astigmatism as we just did. The condenser lens astigmatism is when we converge the beam and uh, see, the, see this beam, see whether it's uh, round or not. And uh, let's center it, spread it out. The objective lens astigmatism is um, when we see the Fourier transform in here. Let's change the focus a little bit so that we see the rings here. And we want to make these rings round. So if we Right now, I'm, I think I'm happy with this, but I can show you again, show you the uh, what is right, what is wrong. So you go to the stigmator, click objective. So um, let's copy this to column two and uh, mess it up. Okay, so right now you see this Fourier transform is uh, the rings are obviously in, a, in an oval shape. So you should be able to fix that with the condense, uh, objective lens astigmator with the multifunction x, y button. Okay, something like that. That is pretty circular. So if you click now, it, the software is gonna memorize uh, this setting. So actually, I'm gonna do it a little bit more. Okay, so something like that. Okay, so here, um, that's the end of our alignment. So if uh, you finish all of this, now you are ready to get the images. So just move over to the, same, the region of interest, uh, change the magnifications you want. So one, one trick is that when you change the magnification, see this beam center uh, usually moves. So usually you want to like if you just change to this magnification, you want to converge the beam to see if the center is still at the center. If it's not, correct it using this uh, trackball and then spread it out. So now we are ready to take the images. Um, to take the images, we will need to Let's go over this um, the TAM PC. 
So next time you come to uh, the you come into this real room, you can find this Gaten PC just uh, next to the the TEM PC to the right side of the TEM PC. So right now I switched the scene to the Gaten PC. So on the Gaten PC you will need the digital micrograph this software running and uh, this is actually the only software we need on this GATEM PC um, so to take the images you come to the right side it says technique manager uh, you can see PEM, STEM and an analytical uh, you you go to this TEM and just click this TEM imaging. Then in the sub menu, you can see this uh, bottom mount one view camera. Uh, so on this tool, we only have one camera for the TEM, which is the one view camera. So here, <coughs> this is the the menu for um, configuring. Uh, the one view for the image capture. So first, like here, it, it has a switch between I and D. I means imaging and D means diffraction. It changes the dynamic range, um, how, how it op optimizes the dynamic range. So um, right now, we, cause we are just going to take an image of the gold nanoparticles so we will use the image and I will show you the diffraction in a minute. Um, and here you can change the resolution 4K, 2K, 1K, 512. Because uh, the, the one view camera is uh, capable of ca taking 4K uh, images um, and 4K videos at a uh, at a frame rate of uh, 30 frames per second. So usually uh, that's, the, that's the point we like one view. So usually uh, we just put it to the 4K. And uh, for so here you can see the view and the capture. You can set the exposure time uh, for the view, for the capture. So for the view, uh, you can just set it to a, a, a small time like right now it's a uh, 0.03, that should be good. So if you click view, you will hear the hissing sound. Uh, that means the one view is now inserting. And uh, you will see this pop-up window that's showing the live view of the one view. So let's, let's go back to the Talos. And take uh, talk about this again. So right now we uh, assume that this is the region of interest we want to take. So again, I want to say that I want to emphasize you you want to uh, check the beam center and spread it out. If you take the picture like this, because the the beam is too strong right now it's going you you're going to damage the camera so remember you want to spread it out to you know make the beam to cover the entire flu cam so this is the safe range for the for the camera and the camera is actually underneath the underneath this flu cam so we will need to retract flu cam uh, in order to use the the one view, so the hot key for that is uh, R1 button over here. So you click the R1. So right now on the flu cam, you can see this pause, this pause icon, and it says column valves open, screen retracted. All right, and uh, if you switch over to Gaten, now. You should be able to see uh, whatever was uh, just showing on the flu cam. So this is our sample. And here you can fine tune your sample positions using the joystick. 
you can change the focus using the focus knob and just take the image. So let's talk about the focus. So usually uh, if you are you are trying to take the high resolution TEM, let's go to uh, while you have a live view over here, you can go to process and live FFT to open up a live FFT button, a uh, live FFT window. So now on the right window, you can see the FFT. Let's zoom it in a little bit. So now you see these uh, rings are actually uh, from the lattice fringes showing um, in this image, but you can also see these rings. So that's the same rings uh, we just saw on the flu cam. And if we change the focus, you see the rings, they are actually changing. So the first thing I want to say, what I want to say is this uh, shape, because you can obviously say uh, see it's, uh, it's in an oval shape so that's the objective lens astigmatism so apparently uh, we just fixed that but uh, it was at the lower mag so at higher mag we we should be able to see that more clearly so it still has an oval shape so um, you come back to the TM uh, user interface, go to the stigmator, and uh, turn on the stigmator using multifunction XY to correct that. So right now I am changing the objective lens astigmator, astigmatism. So right now you see it's, uh, it's pretty round like that. Okay, maybe just a little bit more. Okay, something like that. All right, so let's uh, talk about these rings again. So these rings um, are not only the indicator of the objective lens astigmatism, if you want to take high resolution TEM images, it also tells you the focus point. So right now I am changing the focus and you can see those rings, they are changing the size. And apparently like here, there are no rings showing anymore except these rings. And from here, if I change the focus to the counterclockwise, I can make the rings showing up again. So I now I'm going back to clockwise. Now the rings are all disappeared. If I continue to change the knob to clockwise, now they are showing up again. So that kind of tells us this and this uh, this status is kind of special because we are we don't have the rings showing up. Um, it, indeed, it is special. Uh, this is uh, this is at the point where you are very very close to the the focal point, and usually we just refer it in focus in focus point, and so. Um, to, to change the focus, this, this foil transform will tell you clearly where your in-focus point is. It's just at the moment where you don't see the rings. However, if you come back to the image, you usually, at this moment, you usually don't have a very good image showing up. Like you can, you can see that your image is kind of fuzzy. So actually, um, the best focal point is uh, you want to go under focus. So what is under focus? 
So right now we are referring this in, uh, in focus point. If we say this this point equals to uh, focus focus defocus equals zero, and then we change the focus knob um, counterclockwise. We make the we make the range showing up again. So right now, remember, uh, right now we we uh, we change the focus just from the uh, defocus equals zero point to the uh, counterclockwise side. So we we just define this side as a um, under focus. So if we go back to the TEM user interface, you should be able to see the defocus value over here. So sorry, I can't show the two screens uh, at the same time. But right now, I change that focus. Uh, I, I just made that uh, rings disappeared. And uh, right now, you can see the defocus. This, this is uh, just the absolute value that the machine reads. It doesn't mean anything, but it, give, it gives you a reference. So like now, right now, it says 2.26 nanometer. Um, in fact, right now, at, this, at, at our sample, our defocus is actually zero. So, or very close to zero. So we can, um, we can just uh, think now the defocus is uh, zero. And then we want to change the focus to the under focus to um, counterclockwise to let's do 50, about 50 nanometers like that. <clears throat> so remember, we started from 2. And right now, we are negative for 64. So we changed. Uh, about 66 nanometers under focus. So see, uh, right now it's the negative value because um, we are under focus. So to the under focus side, the focus value is going to decrease. All right. So then let's go back to the Gatan. We see that we have a very faint rain showing up. And if we take a look at the image, right now, actually, the image is uh, very sharp. Um, it's not like that fuzzy uh, image where, when we were at in focus point. And remember, I just did that. I just did about 60 nanometers under focus. So the reason. Um, I want to do about 60 nanometers is um, this focus is uh, I, wa I we want to get the sh get it close to the shader focus on our tool the, sh the shader focus is uh, about 60 50 to 60 nanometers it's it depends on the actual um, cro uh, spherical aberration value um, but I can tell you that uh, it's about 50 to 60 nanometers. So from that in focus point, you go to about 50 to 60 nanometers under focus. You you should be able to get the best image, like here. So now you can set the exposure time to the capture and just click the capture button. So then this is just an image you have captured. Um, it will appear in the tabs over here in the digital micrograph. And you can see when you zoom in, you see uh, very clear lattice fringes. See here. And it's uh, very sharp. So that's basically how you get a TEM image. So um, I'm going to pause here and see if uh, anybody has um, a question.
about the things we just uh, covered. So if you have a question, please post in the chat area. And uh, if you don't have uh, questions, we will just go ahead um, and do and show the diffraction and the dark field imaging. Okay, so let's go back to Talos. Let's uh, lower the screen by pressing the R1 button again. So now we have our image showing on the flu cam. Um, one thing I have to um, emphasize is that, say, now we have uh, finished the imaging in this area and we want to probably change to another area and also maybe change the magnification so uh, when we, whenever we want to do that, we will need to go back to the flu cam. So we lower the screen by pressing R1. We find the, the best uh, position we want. And uh, we, we check the beam, center the beam, and we uh, adjust the magnification that we want. For example, let's let's take a lower mag image like that. So say now we want to take this image. So we we will just go back to the flu cam to to set up everything, find the region of interest. Then let's press the R1 again and go to Gaten. Now this image will show up on Gaten. So right now, if you take a look at the Fourier transform in here, you you don't have the rings because uh, right now we are at uh, lower mag. So um, then there is no way to 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 tell the focus point on the live FFT. But you 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 still need to change the focus on this. So uh, to find the best focus point, maybe we just zoom in, uh, I mean the digital zoom on the image a little bit and we change the focus and see how the image changes. So right now I changed the focus largely and you start to see this black fringe just outside the sample sample area. So whenever it, it's a black, that's the Fresnel fringe. When the fringe is black, that tells you you are over focus. So that means you have to turn the focus knob uh, counterclockwise, you know, to the under focus side, to the point where you start to see the white edge like that so whenever you see the white edge that means you're you are under focus so now if you change to the over focus side and the, at the point you will you will find that your image is very fuzzy just like what what we did on uh, what we did on uh, while we were working on the uh, life for your transform so again, when remember um, when the image was fuzzy on the live FFT, we don't have the rings and we call it in focus. The same thing happened here. When the image is fuzzy, we just call it the in focus. So right now, you can go back to Talos uh, TEM user interface, take a look at the defocus value here. And uh, you treat this defocus number as zero, and uh, from this number you go to under focus side to about uh, sixty nanometers, so two ninety, 
you want to go uh, 60 more so that's gonna be three about 350 so about there um, let's go back to Catan so you see now the image shows a little bit white white uh, edge that's actually um, the focus point we want we want to again take the image at slightly um, under focus side so now if we come to here and click capture we should be able to get an image get a nice image here so. close that so this is the new image we just taken All right, and uh, let's go back to our TM user interface. So just now we we uh, were able to take two nice images, but um, let me show show you something more. So sometimes uh, you will hear like uh, TM bright field images dark field images or diffraction patterns so those are referring to different imaging techniques in the TEM mode um, so whenever you see the bright field images that's also like uh, paired with the dark field so um, that's uh, something related to the diffraction imaging so I think I'm going to br briefly explain that uh, and starting with uh, diffraction. So for example, if we want to take a diffraction pattern in this, for example, this one, two, three, four squares, let's move our region of interest to the center of the screen and then to take a diffraction pattern it's usually the selected area electron diffraction so you will need the selected area aperture which appears in the aperture window so selected area we have a, a bunch of different selected area apertures um, let's just try try this 200 see how big it is okay it looks like it's a uh, pretty big it's even bigger than the field of view so let's use the uh, 40 okay so now you see the selected area aperture is showing here and uh, we come to the aperture and click adjust uh, we use the multi function x y to move the aperture right back to the center and under the aperture we can see those four squares uh, those are the region of interest okay and now let's disable this adjust and uh, let's come back to the um, right hand panel you see the diffraction button over here so if you click this diffraction this flow cam changed to, to a diffraction pattern and uh, let's change the uh, contrast a little bit and uh, in the diffraction mode um, you see here it changed to the diffraction D and this is the your camera lens it's a uh, kind of similar to the magnification and you can change the magnification or the camera lens using the magnification knob so if you change that your diffraction patterns gonna zoom in and out like that so bigger camera lens means you get uh, bigger diffraction patterns alright and there is also the defocus 
So if you click the eucentric, this defocus is going to memorize whatever the previous uh, user did previous user did on the default on the focus knob so if you click this eucentric focus it's gonna reset whatever the previous user did on the defocus and uh, for the diffraction pattern we will need the parallel beam so we will change the intensity to uh, clockwise and you see now uh, the the diffraction rings are very faint only the the first the center the center spot is showing up but again you can change the the brightness contrast using the mouse wheel button on the flu cam so that you can still see the rings okay so um, to take a good diffraction pattern, um, make sure that you change the intensity knob fully clockwise. So in this way, you get a um, good parallel beam. But at the same time, uh, your beam is going to be very weak. Uh, this is also important to protect our uh, one view camera because you see this uh, center spot it's very strong. Um, if you don't weaker your weaken your beam, uh, your the beam the center beam is gonna damage the camera when you take the images. So it's very important that you change the intensity knob to uh, fully clockwise to minimize the beam intensity. Then sometimes you see this uh, uh, diffraction pattern. It's not at the center, and usually, like f f it's it doesn't matter actually if you just take this image, but um, for the microscopist, we want everything centered or symmetric or things like that. So if you ever want to move the diffraction pattern, you come to this alignment, go to direct alignments, and in here you you see you find the diffraction alignment. Just click that, and now you are able to move the diffraction pattern using the multifunction knobs, like that. So let's just move that pattern to the center. All right. And uh, so right now we should be able to get this. We are ready to uh, take this image. Uh, so the image, the procedure is the same. We want to lift up the screen so that our one view can see this pattern. But before doing that, let's go to Gaten and set the things up here. So as I just told you, we have uh, image mode and diffraction mode. So right now we are we are trying to take diffraction, so we click the D. Now I switch to the diffraction mode, and this is view uh, exposure. It doesn't matter. 0.15 is good enough, but the capture, the exposure time for the capture is uh, very important. You don't want a very long exposure time. You want to minimize the exposure time when you are taking the diffraction patterns with very strong center beam. So. You can let's change it to uh, 0.5 second. So now it's still viewing. So now let's uh, lift up the screen by pressing R1. And now we, we see the diffraction pattern showing up here. So we just click capture. Okay, so that's captured. And then it's very important that we we lower our um, we insert our screen immediately after we uh, have taken that diffraction pattern to minimize that exposure. So let's come to here. So this is our diffraction. 
And sometimes you will find the center beam is really, really strong. Even if we uh, change the intensity to fully clockwise, it's still very strong. Um, that's when you want to use a beam stopper. The beam stopper button is controlled on the um, flu cam toolbar. So in here you can find this is uh, insert beam stop, this is halfway insert, this is uh, out. So right now it's out. So if you click this insert beam stop, all right. So now you can see the beam stopper right now it's inserted right here or you can use halfway insert so it retracts halfway so for this kind of diffraction pattern I usually just use halfway and uh, I will move the strong spot just under that tip so it won't cover too much of the useful information something like that using diffraction alignment so again let's go back to the 10 let's lift up the screen so this time we see nice diffraction pattern with the beam stopper and uh, let's take this image by clicking the capture button and uh, insert the screen immediately after that so now we get a nice diffraction pattern with this uh, beam stopper. Okay, so that is that is the um, diffraction imaging. Let's go back to TEM and let's retract the beam stopper. Okay, so this is our uh, diffraction pattern. Let's move it back to center. So, next I will I will show you the um, how to take uh, bright field images. When you whenever you refer to bright field, that usually means you will need an objective lens aperture. So. Right now we are using a selected area aperture because we are taking a selected area diffraction pattern. And for the bright field image, let's just insert an objective aperture. Say, um, you see there are also a bunch of different sizes over here. So let's just use, for example, 30. All right, so let's give it a little bit of intensity. So right now you can see uh, All right, so this is the aperture, the objective aperture we just inserted. Um, just um, want, just want you to know that, the objective apertures can only be seen in the diffraction mode. You cannot, usually you cannot see it in the image mode, but when it's misaligned, you can sometimes see the edge. But the proper way to align the objective lens aperture is that you align it in the diffraction mode. So like here, if you click adjust, you should be able to move it over like that. So let's go back to the topic of the bright field. Um, when you when people say bright field, that usually means they put a uh, an objective lens aperture and just select the direct beam in the diffraction space like that. Um, you can let's change to another uh, bigger aperture. So like if we use a hundred we can still get the bright field to select the center spot and also some diffraction rings. This also can make you a bright field image. And to see the actual image, 
you will need to go out of the diffraction mode. So you click the diffraction button again. So now you are in the image mode. But remember, we have the selected area aperture in, uh, which is blocking our image. So we can take it out by clicking this selected area button. So now we are seeing we are seeing the image and uh, remember right now we are uh, using a hundred um, objective aperture so let's take it out and uh, compare so probably um, hundred you probably cannot see too much difference and if we use 30 Okay, so right now it's uh, more clear that uh, you have better contrast on the image. So again, so right now the 30 is in and let's take it out. You can compare. So right now the contrast is a little bit less than when we have the aperture in. So usually um, just one um, one example is that when you want to enhance the uh, contrast, you want to insert an objective aperture, so like that. And then if you want to take this image, you just go over to Gaten and do and just do the same procedures to take this image. To save time, I'm not uh, gonna show that. So this is uh, how you uh, gonna do the object. Uh, the bright field PM bright field image. So let's insert the selected area and go to the object, go to the diffraction space again. So as I just said, uh, when the objective lens aperture is selecting the center beam, you are getting the bright field. So the opposite term is the dark field. That is when your aperture is moving out of the center. So like something like that. So right now you are not we are not allowing the center beam to come through. But we are only allowing this por portion of the diffraction diffracted beam going through. So if we form an image with this condition, that's going to show us a dark field image. Uh, in a dark field image, whatever we are selecting in the diffraction space is going to go through the aperture and to form the image. This is very important. For example, when we have uh, different phases, they will show different diffraction patterns in the diffraction space. Then we should be able to um, move our aperture around to select different diffraction spots and to form our image. Uh, so in that way, we should be able to select only the face we are interested in to form our image. So let's go back to the diffraction, uh, go back to the image mode by press this uh, diffraction button and uh, remove the selected area aperture. So right now we are we are forming a diffract, uh, a dark field image. So you can clearly see that how it's different than the bright field image we were just showing. Um, one the biggest difference is that in the bright field your background is uh, bright and in the dark field your back your background is dark and you see these little spots showing up those are actually um, the nano the gold nanoparticles that that are contributing the diffraction uh, the diffraction rings that portion of diffraction rings we just selected in the uh, diffraction space. So to take this image, we can go over to Gaten. Um, 
lip tab screen and just uh, let's go to the image mode and just hit capture okay so now we get this uh, dark field image and let's go back to the the TM user interface because there is uh, one last thing I want to show you um, for the dark field imaging because um, let's go to the uh, diffraction space again where we can see that's our um, Objective lens aperture is selecting a portion of the diffraction peak. So, usually, um, I I will I will refer this kind of dark field and the dirty dark field. Uh, the reason we call it I call it dirty is because right now you are not forming the image using the parallel you using the beam that is parallel to the optical axis. You are using the off-axis beams to form the image. Um, that will that will sometimes um, uh, give you like deteriorate your um, image resolution and image quality. So remember um, the the on-axis portion of the beam can give you the best image. So Let's take the objective aperture out and talk about this diffraction pattern again. So let's align it to the center. So this is our diffraction button, a uh, diffraction pattern. So let's, in order to get a better dark field, um, another way is to do the center dark field. So if you go back to this right hand panel, there is a dark field button. If you click that dark field, right now there is no change on the on the screen, but now the multifunction x y are assigned to the beam tilt. So if you use the multifunction x y, right now you can actually move your diffraction pattern. So this diffraction this movement of diffraction pattern is not the same as we just did that using the diffraction alignment so right now we are actually tilting the beam like here i am just uh, i i am just tilting this ring like this portion of the diffracted beam back to the optical axis while the direct beam is now off axis. So rem remember right now we are in the dark field mode. If we click dark field again, right now we uh, we went back to the bright field. So we still see that our di direct beam is right on the optical axis. So this is, the, is my favorite way to do uh, the dark field imaging. So if, and it's recommended. Um, so let's go to the stage and go to objective. Let's this time use a smaller objective lens aperture. Okay, so this, this 10 is the smallest. Let's adjust it to the center. So right now, only the center beam is allowed to go through this aperture. But when we click the dark field, you see what? Now only this small portion uh, that we tilted back to the, the optical axis is allowed to go through this um, uh, objective lens aperture. So let's go back to the image mode by pressing diffraction button and uh, let's remove the object uh, selected area aperture. So
So now we are getting a so-called center dark field in when the this dark field uh, button is on. And if we right now click the dark field button again, now we jump back to the bright field uh, where remember uh, only the center spot is allowed to go through that aperture. So in this mode, we can just switch from the a switch between the dark field and the bright field uh, without changing anything. And uh, to get a dark field, uh, we are selecting the beam that was tilted uh, to the on the zone uh, on the optical axis. So we are forming the image using the on axis beam, which is supposed to give us a higher quality image. So let's go to the 10. So now we are seeing a dark field image and we can capture this. <clears throat> and uh, after that, we can click the uh, dark field button to switch it back to the bright field. We can capture this image also. OK, so now we got two images one bright field one dark field they they were required uh, they were acquired at the exactly the same position so uh, for for the users who want to do uh, like a, uh, like a dislocation imaging like uh, stacking faults, uh, second, secondary phases, so those defects. Um, this technique is used a lot, and usually you show the bright field and dark field as pairs. Of course, also together with the diffraction pattern, and uh, indicate uh, which spot you were tilted back to the optical axis. So like diffraction pattern, bright field, dark field, they are a set of data that you are going to, for example, show in your publication or things like that. OK, so I think that's all the thing I have uh, for the TEM imaging. Is there any questions? Um, it looks like um, everybody is just very quiet today. There's no. Uh, okay, I saw one question. If you are using a double tilt holder, how do you tilt the holder to go to the specific zone axis? So that's a great question. Um, to tilt the sample, I think, um, Kathleen, you are. Um, you are very, You should be very familiar with the um, with tilting your sample like on our old uh, like twenty ten or thirty one hundred. So usually, when you have a big uh, crystal, uh, when which uh, you want to tilt, uh, you will usually need to see the Kikuchi patterns. And the way to see the Kikuchi pattern is that you convert your beam. So the same thing here, convert your beam using the intensity. Let's center the beam, put the beam on your crystal, and just press diffraction button. And you will see the diffraction pa uh, pattern. Uh, this is a, actually the converged beam diffraction pattern. Um, because I am using just uh, the gold nanoparticles, they are not going to uh, be any Kikuchi band showing at this mag. But if you have a big uh, crystal, you should be able to see the Kikuchi band. And then uh, according to the Kikuchi band, you should be able to guess 
where you are and then to tilt the sample you can come to here uh, let's move it over a little bit so I don't know if you can read the words so these two are the alpha tilt so alpha minus alpha plus so if you press it you can actually see it here a means alpha tilt um, I don't know why they uh, interchange a b with alpha beta but anyway if you press this button you see it's tilting now to the negative position uh, direction and you can also tilt it to the positive using this button oh but um, you probably you saw it just jumped from just a few degrees to 11 degrees so uh, when you tilt the sample please be extra careful that these these buttons are kind of pressure sensitive if you push it harder it can go very fast like that if you push it uh, softer gently it will slow down there is no like this step button controlling these buttons so um, usually when when uh, it's safe you you you're not gonna have anything like uh, crash on the pole piece there is uh, no harm to tilt it faster but usually you don't want to do that because uh, when if you tilt it too fast and when you when the tilting is hitting the limit you have the uh, possibility to make it crash the software will detect that pole touch and stop you before you have any physical touch but if you do that too fast the software may not be able to stop you in time so just try to tilt it slowly like that so for the tilting range uh, right now we are using a single tilt um, for the single tilt uh, we should be able to tilt it plus minus I'll say 40 so right now we are at 40 without the problem but at the same time you see now the objective lens aperture is disabled uh, so at high tilt the objective lamp lens aperture is not allowed to put it, to insert it if now we tilt it back to about let's say 50 uh, 15 so now it's uh, enabled again so remember when you are you have an objective lens aperture in it's going to limit your tilt range you have to be careful about that also um, I don't recommend you tilt with an objective aperture in because um, you not only have a smaller range you also have a higher chance to crash the holder to the objective lens aperture so the same thing on the beta tilt i don't have the beta tilt uh, enabled here because because it's a single tilt but when you have a double tilt you can tilt uh, beta direction using these two buttons uh, the same thing that you have to be extra careful that uh, you push these buttons gently don't do that too fast Okay, is there any other questions? Um, if we are okay, then um, let's, let's take uh, like about uh, five minutes break. And uh, next we will go to the STEM alignment and uh, STEM imaging and EDS. So, uh, so now it's one ten. We will uh, see you again at one fifteen.
Okay, everybody.、Um, is everybody still there? Are we ready to go to the STEM? Uh, it looks like everybody is still is very quiet today.、Um, now it's、uh, one seventeen.、Uh, so I assume、um, no answer is、uh, good. So we will、um, go ahead and start the stem alignment. <coughs> so. Um, if we want to do the stem, so the same thing we can go to the fag and、uh, go fag register, and this time we can set the 200 kV stem alignment. Like we have two, we have 200 kV stem EDS. This is good for EDS. It will give you higher、uh, big beam current. And this is for high resolution stem. It should give you better、uh, resolution. <coughs>、um, so most most of the time, if you are not、uh, aiming to get like very high resolution image in stem, you can just use this、uh, stem EDS. And、uh, by the way, also if you want to. Uh, come back to the TEM later. You can right now save save this、uh, current this save this alignment as、uh, something temporarily, like for example, two hundred kV TEM、uh, temp, and click this add. So it shows up here. So whenever you feel you want to、uh, switch it back to TEM, instead of loading this one, we can just load this one. So it will bring you back to this alignment. <coughs> And also, you are allowed to save the fact registers as in this folder. You can.、Uh, Name it whatever. For example, training, save. So,、um, next time when you come and you can open this training,、um, fag, and to use whatever、uh, files you have saved here.、Um, of course, if you want, you can just use my alignment, because、uh, I I will、um, update. To、uh, stem alignment and this TEM alignment whenever、uh, I am on this machine. Okay, so let's just go ahead and select the 200 kV alignment and click set. So now it's switching the mode. Okay, we'll wait until it's done, and now in the it it switched to stem mode. You see, here it says STEM, and here is the magnification. <coughs> and on the flu cam, this is、uh, the only thing you are seeing.、Um, this is so in the stem mode, you won't see a big、uh, screen of whatever your sample image. You are you always see a small beam like this.、Uh, let's switch it to the natural, so should be able to see it clearly. And、uh, let's go to the stage. So、um, see if you load my alignment file, the condenser two is automatically switched to seventy. Um, we use seventy for、uh, high resolution imaging. Also, the EDS because on this tool, suppose seventy、uh, micron condenser lens aperture is going to give us the best resolution. And、uh, so far, all、uh, my best images were taken 
under this condition. Okay, so if you have the uh, SOP in hand, um, just want to let you know that we are at 3.4 stem alignment. So no matter you just started your experiment or you switched from TEM to STEM, just like what, what we did before, now we'll have to go through the STEM alignment procedures. So there is a tab here called STEM. Um, so in the STEM mode, most, most of the time you, you are going to be in this tab. So in the STEM, uh, the first window is called STEM imaging. Here you, you get like search, acquire, and here STEM detector, you are able to select different detectors. And you also have direct alignments that we will use later. So let's follow the SOP. So it says load the STEM alignment, which we just did. And uh, again, here we will need to do the eucentric height. Um, because we just switched from TEM to STEM, we should be very close to the eucentric height. But if now you just started from loading your sample, you you are probably uh, very far away. So uh, just for the demonstration purpose, let's reset the holder. Assuming that we have just started our experiment. Okay. So when we open the beam valve, um, see on the flu, flu cam, we can barely see anything. It's just a little bit glowing over here. This is um, the most common um, situation where remember we have the grid and our beam is right now blocked uh, by the grid bar. So the first thing is still to find the sample so we can just use the joystick let's change the let's zoom out use the joystick to move your sample around until okay until you see a clear beam on your on your on the flu cam all right so then, uh, in the SOP, I have listed two methods to find the eucentric uh, focus button. So method one is, um, if you are familiar with our 2100 and 3100, uh, this method is similar to how we find eucentric focus, eucentric height on those two TEMs. So you are just watching this beam or here from here I'm gonna call it Ronke Graham. Uh, so if you look at inside this small beam clear uh, carefully right now you you can uh, see the image like you see the square bar over here now um, let's first press the eucentric focus button that's gonna reset the defocus to zero and then let's change the Z uh, let's move it a little bit here so we have the Z button over here um, so we have the Z button over here and we can move our Z and take a look at the ronchigram so you see the ronchigram changed and right now you are like right now we are really seeing the ronchigram like like uh, really nothing showing up in the center and if we keep going we now started to see the image like the small particles inside again so I'm going back 
like here we see the flat area so that's gonna be our eccentric height so this is method one and uh, it requires some knowledge on uh, the stem the the operations on like 2100 and 3100 and understanding on the ronky gram but if you you are not yet that level it doesn't matter because uh, I'm gonna introduce the method too. This method is actually easier. So you go to the stem and uh, check the stem detectors. Make sure the HADF, HADF is selected. And at this time, you don't want any other detectors. So uncheck any other detectors and just check the HADF and uh, let's let's go to the stem imaging and just click search now let's go to the tm imaging and analysis Some reason my screen is not switching. Come on. Uh, stop. Okay, so, um, oops, why it's not showing again? Okay, so now if we we'll go to the TM user interface, on, oh sorry, uh, TM image and analysis, you should be able to see your sample. So then if you just adjust the Z height, your sample is going to be going in and out of focus. So the easy, uh, the, re the reason I want, uh, I see it's easy is because when, when we adjust the Z to get the very sharp image, in here, that means our sample is right at the eccentric height. So this, it looks like this uh, method is more straightforward. And uh, especially for those beginners, I highly recommend this method. So right now, you can see the sample, the image is, uh, the image is uh, right in focus. So, Now we are uh, at eucentric height, so now we can just stop search. And that's the eucentric height. So next, we will go through the stem alignment procedures. So here, um, oh, one thing, one more thing I want to show is this a little bit over the the contrast and the brightness so right now it it looks okay but sometimes the contrast can be very like weird out of the range so in that case we can come back to the tm user interface under the stem detector we can 
click this auto fog auto um, c slash b contrast brightness so we just click that button the software is gonna adjust that for us so then we come back to here um i know it didn't change too much but for some reason the software thinks this is better so that's the brightness and contrast and uh, let's come back to here and uh, really go to the um, stem alignment and now we are at 3.4.3 in the SOP so probe alignment we will first stop the search in this tab so the search is stopped and now we are seeing the beam on the flu cam and let's press the diffraction button on the right hand panel so click that all right and now we should uh, be able to see the beam showing up on on our flu cam if you don't see it turn on zoom out and you should be able to see it and uh, at this point uh, it is very important that you click that eucentric focus again so because that's gonna normalize your beam and get rid of the hysteresis so right now you should be able to see a very sharp beam focused beam so that's the actual beam we are using for the stem imaging um, now um, 3.4.3.3 um, that is kind of a confusing part it says you you want to adjust the focus knob to get a focused beam with a bright spot in the center so take a look at here there's only a bright spot um, now I'm gonna adjust focus okay so now if you take a look at it there is a bright spot right at the center but you can still you can also see a shadow <clears throat> so this is the this is the focus point we want to uh, get uh, in this probe alignment so actually you you want to just go to the over focus just a little bit well it was it was like this where you can only see a focus beam go to the foc over focus side a little bit so you see a bright spot and the shadow all right and then let's do the following beam shift go to the bright uh, direct alignment click the beam shift change using the multi-function x y to move it back to the center all right and then next we will do the beam tilt pivot point so again you come to the direct alignments and use uh, M MP Nano Pro Beam Tilt Pivot Point X. You click that. Now you're gonna see the beam is uh, uh, wobbling and split splitting into two parts. So here, uh, one important thing is that um, you you wanna identify your beam. Like th there's a bright spot over here and the bright spot over here. You wanna overlap those two parts using the multifunction x y like that so you you usually uh, you you don't want be like that that's incorrect so you want to do it like that so only this bright spot the bright spots are overlapping because that's your actual beam position and you do the same thing for the y Right, something like that and call it down all right so next we will do center c2 aperture 
So we click the center C2 aperture. Now your beam's gonna wobble. And uh, because not right now our magnification is too high for this, we wanna zoom out until we see the beam, the, the uh, entire beam wobbling. So now we will we can use multifunction x y to do that. Actually, right now it's uh, it looks good. Um, I can show you what is bad. So like that, right now beam is swinging like from this to this, this direction to this direction. That is uh, an indicator of uh, your C two aperture is off aligned. So you use the multifunction x y to move to make that wobbling concentric so something like that that would be great and let's click down and then let's go back to the Mac we were we were at uh, 500 kx and you see the beam is a little bit off-centered and usually here I will click the eccentric focus button again to normalize the beam and get rid of the hysteresis okay so now you see the beam appears up there let's move the beam The movement of the beam position is also because of the hysteresis um, when we change the magnification. All right, so we move it back to here. And now let's take a look at here. So we can now we can see a bright spot and a shadow. Um, I can get rid of the screen marker so we see it more clearly. So now we see a bright spot and a shadow. And if you look at it carefully, the bright spot is not right at the center of the shadow. Um, that tells us the beam tilt is a little bit off. So we can fix that by using this rotation center intensity. So we click this rotation center. Now the beam starts to wobble again. And uh, we want to stop that wobbling by using this um, the focus step knob. The focus step is like this bigger, the bigger ring on the focus. Uh, so the focus knob is not like uh, the ones on the JUL well, where you have fine and the coarse so here only the the upper part is the focus but the this ring is the focus step so you you'll be able to change the focus step and uh, right now when we are at the rotation center intensity we should be able to change the magnet magnitude of that wobbling using this focus step so if you turn it fully counterclockwise, so right now you see that wobbling stopped. But if you change it to um, clockwise, now you see it's wobbling with a very large magnitude. So right now we want the wobbling to stop so that we can see this uh, center spot and this shadow clearly. And now let's use multifunction x, y. So you see when I move, when I change the multifunction x, y knob, you can actually move the bright spot inside that shadow. Can you see that? <coughs> All right. So right now, now we will have to move that bright spot right to the center of that shadow. So something like that, that should fix our beam tilt problem. Okay, so um, one last thing, one last thing we uh, want to do here is the astigmatism. 
because probably you have noticed that our beam is not round. It's a kind of oval shape along this direction. So that tells us there is a condenser astigmatism. So you can <clears throat> go to here and uh, get the stigmator out and select the condenser. <clears throat> so here you can change the multifunction x, y to really fix that beam um, oval shape. So something like that. This is just uh, the rough alignment. We will do the fine tuning of the stigmatism later. So here you can just uh, move, uh, do it, uh, change it roughly uh, round. And uh, I just want to tweak the rotation center a little bit more so that we get perfect um, bright spot uh, perfectly at the center of the shadow. All right. And uh, let's get out of the beam screen marker and uh, move that beam to the center of the screen using the beam shift. And uh, that's the end of the probe alignment. So now we can click the diffraction button to go to the normal um, stem mode, stem imaging mode. All right. So next, now we are at uh, 3.4.4. We are going to fight in the Ronke gram. So again, we we recall we refer this uh, small beam as the Ronke gram. So it says um, click the eucentric focus to reset the defocus. So let's just click that. All right, and then uh, let's start a. Uh, Live view in the TIA by click searching and uh, let's zoom in. It says we have to uh, zoom in at a magnification higher than uh, 160kx. So right now I am at 900kx, so it should be good. And you can see the image is was a little bit out of focus. I changed the Z a little bit, so right now it's right in focus. So come back to TEM user interface. We can stop searching. So right now we are still seeing the Ronke gram over here. Let's go back to TEM uh, imaging and analysis. Let's use this tool. Beam, it says beam position marker tool. So click that on the image and it says one. And uh, if you drag this tool, you are actually controlling the beam. So right now, the when we drag the tool, the beam is moving uh, following our movement like that. So now we want to put this marker to somewhere that is uh, amorphous. For example, like here, it should be amorphous. And then let's go back to TEM uh, user interface. And uh, we want to uh, change the camera lens. The camera lens is over here. So the working, the Im normal imaging condition is uh, 98 millimeter. Uh, which gives you the small beam, but you want to make it bigger by increasing the camera lens just for the alignment purpose. So right now I change it to 260. So right now you can see it's uh, bigger, so it's easier for you to uh, do the final fine alignment. Next, you also want to change the aperture from 70 to 150 so that will give you bigger field of view here these up 
these operations are all like uh, temporary. Um, you are not. We are not going to use these settings for the imaging, but we do that just um, to get a good alignment here. So we can come back to the TM user interface, uh, TM imaging analysis. We can move the beam around uh, to really find a amorphous region. Come back to TM user interface, and now we can change the focus. So when we change the focus, let's get rid of the screen marker. So you can see right now the ronky gram is uh, is showing up here. You see really the inside the inside is uh, really flat. But also you can see this ronky gram is kind of oval shape. You see that? So that's the thing we want to fine tune. So let's go to um, Stigmator, and let's turn on the condenser, and uh, let's use the multifunction x, y to tune that. So, as you can see now, it's uh, it's more circular, like before it was like this. So now you can make it like that. See how round it is. And uh, then let's use this this tool to draw a circle on there. So we now this circle we put this circle right on the ronky gram we have, and uh, see how round you you can really see how round it is. Then next we will go to aperture uh, because as I said I we just switched to 150 C2 aperture to see a better a bigger field of view but we are going to use the 70 for actual imaging so we switch to 70 okay so right now the beam is smaller um, because we are using smaller aperture and uh, now we will have to align our 70 aperture to the circle we just put it here because that's gonna be exactly the center of our ronky gram so we'll go to the aperture uh, after so behind the condenser tool there's adjust click that adjust so use the multifunction x y you should be able to move that you see that so you want to put it right on the circle we have just placed. All right, now we don't need the circle anymore, so we can select that and click Delete. Um, then let's go back to uh, TM, STM detector. Let's change it back to 98 millimeter of camera lens okay so now it's a uh, it's very small then let's uh, turn on the screen marker see this is the center of the screen and you can probably see the beam is slightly off center uh, so that's the one last thing we want to adjust is the beam center so we go to direct alignments we go to diffraction alignment, click that, and uh, now use multifunction x, y. We should be able to move our uh, ronky gram. So then we will align the ronky gram right at the center of the screen, just like that, and click down. So that's the end of our alignment procedures in the stem mode. So right now you can click search, come back to the TEM uh, image and analysis. You should be able to see um, nice and sharp images on the 
on the TM image analysis. So we can from here we can move around, we can zoom in. Let's see if we can um, see the lattice on these particles. Because um, on the Talos, we should be able to get about 1.3 angstroms of uh, resolution. So um, let's go back to here. So in the TM user interface, it has this nice function for the focus. So if you click this focus, let's come back to here. You see there is a small window popping up, just like what you usually do in on the SEM. So it helps you to focus the focus, uh, fine tune your focus. So actually in here, I am already seeing some lattice fringes, so that's good. And if we are satisfied with this image, we can come back to here and just hit this acquire. Oh, and before we before doing that, let's take a look at the image acquiring um, conditions. So here we have the dual time. Oh, that's. That's for the focus. So uh, disable that focus. Um, let's come to here. Um, in the drop down window, there are search, preview, acquire. So for the acquire, we can just select it. And uh, <clears throat> here, from here, we should be able to change the frame size. Like here, right now, the frame size is set to 1K by 1K. Um, usually that's good enough. I just always use 1K by 1K resolution, uh, but you should be able to change it to 4K by 4K. But I just don't use that very often. So here you have dual time, uh, 6.4 microseconds uh, at each uh, each pixel is good. Also you can increase to 12.8. Uh, I won't go higher than this because that's going to be a very slow scan and you your image is going to uh, suffering from the sample drift a lot. So let's do this. Um, actually, I'm going to move sample a little bit. My sample is uh, has a uh, been placed on my um, desk for a long time. It got just got some um, contamination, so let's move it around and uh, let's hit this acquire button. Coming back to this um, Tia. some reason it stopped switching so my screen at okay okay so this is an image we just acquired using our uh, scanning uh, using our uh, hard f detector so actually, here you can see just a little bit lattice inside here. Um, I I think if we use if we use this high HR stem fag register, we should be able to get better uh, resolution and better lattice image. But that's not the the point of today's training. Um, so, 
if we want to use other detectors, we just like we click whatever detectors we want from here. So here uh, on this tool, we have four detectors. The hard diff is a kind of default for the stem imaging, and most of the time you you're gonna definitely use hard diff. And sometimes you wanna use bright field, and you just click the bright field. Now the bright field is inserted. Okay, and now it says inserted, but the bright field is like um, underneath the screen. So actually, we have uh, another two detectors, DF4, DF2. So let's insert all of them and uh, take a look at. So when they are all in, hard F is not uh, influenced at all, but like here you, you can see the collection angle uh, for each detector. So they are gonna give you different ranges of um, detect, uh, detection ranges. So uh, like right now, if they are all in, so BF is just a bright field, um, DF4 and DF2 is kind of the low angle and the medium angle uh, dark field images. And uh, these three de uh, detectors all are all underneath the screen. So you have to use R1 to lift up the screen to make them showing. And now it says uh, screen retracted. Then let's go back to the stem imaging and click search. Okay, and here you should be able to see four images, four live images. And uh, right now you see, um, except the hard F, all other detectors are showing um, just wrong, um, just showing images with wrong brightness and contrast. Um, don't worry, we can go back to uh, TEM uh, user interface and click this auto for auto brightness and contrast button. The software is gonna adjust the brightness uh, for us in a minute. But sometimes it will take a little bit of time. Uh, just be patient until this uh, yellow button goes off. All right, so then let's go back to Tia. See, we are seeing uh, these four images with different detection angles. So let's move around. All right. Um, I don't like this, so let's do the auto brightness contrast again. <laughs> and also you can adjust the contrast and brightness by um, these sliding these two things here you can uh, adjust for each uh, individual detectors but I just usually use this auto button because I found it just works so so great so coming coming back to Tia now we are seeing the four images four live images and uh, if we are satisfied we can just hit acquire So now it's acquiring four images at a time. So we have uh, this one is the hard F, this one's our bright field, this is kind of a medium angle um, dark field, and this is kind of low angle dark field. So 
things like that. And uh, also, if you want to save your images, come to here, uh, just file save as. So again, you can uh, save your file here in the user data. And uh, let's just put it in the training. So the TIA saves the images in EMI format. And this is the only format it, it, uh, you are allowed to save. Um, don't worry about the format. I can show you how to convert it later. But uh, very important, you, you just save the, <coughs> raw, the EMI uh, format images always because that's going to be your uh, raw data. So save. <clears throat> and then uh, let's see where is the training. So whenever you save your image, you are going to have one EMI, but you will also have a couple of SER files, depending on um, how many images you have here. So the TIA saves in a way that it puts all the images together in one file. This this one is kind of like a uh, indexing thing, but it also saves uh, uh, four uh, images in, uh, individually. So you have EMI and SER. Um, <clears throat> later, uh, I will show you there is a way to convert SER files into like TIFF, uh, JPEG, uh, so that you can uh, use or process later in other softwares. All right, so this is uh, just basic TEM imaging, uh, sorry, STEM imaging. And uh, now I'm going to show you the um, EDS, because I know so far the our EDS mapping capability has been uh, our user's favorite. So for the EDS, we will need to use this VLOX. Um, in the VLOX, uh, you can also do the imaging. So let's let's do the imaging part first. So in this acquisition window, uh, you can click this. Um, you can find the detectors here. Hard F, DF4, DF2, Brightfield. Uh, just use click whatever um, detectors you want to use. Right like now, you click. I click the hard F. Now it's showing the hard F image. If you also want Brightfield, just click the Brightfield. So now we got two images at the same time. Um, in case we also want DF4, just click DF4. Now we have the DF4 showing here. So this is the scope function can be turned off here. So now we have three live images. And uh, here you can change the image size. So for searching, I always use the 512 by 512. But the dual time, you can use a little bit longer like one microsecond or two microsecond so, um, let's use one microsecond so if you want to take an image uh, move move around find your region of interest zoom in to focus, change focus knob to focus, and then zoom out, and you click this icon to take the image. So image acquiring now is set to 1K by 1K with a 10 microseconds of dual time. You are free to change these um, to up to 4K by 4K. Um, so now we have acquired three, three images. And uh, actually, the VLOX has two different windows. 
Uh, one is uh, called acquisition, and the other one is called um, uh, the, oh, it doesn't have name. It just, it's showing the name of the this file. So whatever uh, data you acquired in here is going to show up here in the other window. So right now we have the hard F image, we have the bright field, this one, we have the dark field. And uh, in here, you don't need to worry about saving your um, data because uh, if you remember, we have set up the autosave uh, at the very beginning when we inserted the sample. You can also confirm the autosave uh, folder by going to uh, acquisition window and edit and the preference so it's showing here it says right now um, where is it oopsies um, okay so it says uh, Z training so this is the position we just set set up um, when we inserted the holder. All right, and uh, right now these three files are saved uh, in that folder. We can take a look. So training, um, today's date, go nanoparticles. Now, all three images are saved in the EMD format. So again, this is the default format. Uh, in Kia, uh, or sorry, in the VLOX, I recommend you always keep this uh, raw data. And uh, I have a way to convert it, uh, which I'm going to show you later. Um, all right. So that's uh, the imaging. Of course, if you right click on any of the images and select export, you have the choice to export um, the images to other part, other formats like PNG, JPEG, TIFF, and uh, so on. So that's the imaging. Um, let's go back to here, and I will show you how to do an EDS mapping. Because for most of the users, that's probably the most interesting part. So. Let's move around, find our region of interest, for example, here. And we can stop searching. So now we are at this, in, uh, this region. So the EDS mapping is controlled here in this module under SI. So if you click SI, it's going to open up another um, menu for you to uh, set up the parameters. Um, this here, the image size, is actually controlled by this. So usually you don't want to um, change your image size. I just always use uh, 512 by 512 because it's uh, used by the searching. But of course, if you want, you can change to like for example, 1K by 1K. So now it says 1K by 1K. Um, I Again, I always use 512 by 512. And uh, another thing you want to set up is the dual time. Dual time controls, you know, um, how long your, your one scan is going to be. Um, so here, it has some preset settings and in the brackets you it, it tells you actual uh, frame time so it's it's um it's very straightforward that you don't want this frame time to be too long because in that case you your your results are going to be suffered a lot from the sample drifting um but when once you have a compromise uh, between the magnification and the sample drifting, then you also want to maximize this uh, dual time. Uh, so 
there is no there's no um exactly right or wrong settings it just uh, depends on the magnification like right now we are at a relatively low mag the sample is very stable so it's right now it's okay to set it to a bit um, longer dual time like 20 microseconds which gives you about six seconds of total frame time it's it's okay uh, for this kind of uh, imaging condition but if you are working at very high mag and your sample is not that stable try to reduce this uh, frame time to like three seconds or even 1.5 seconds okay so that's the dual time and here you can auto stop if you check this box it's gonna stop after it reaches the settings over here so right now it says a uh, thousand and two hundred frames so at a uh, thousand two hundred frames it will stop i usually don't use this function so uncheck it uh, because i always stop it manually whenever i think the the uh, the result is good enough and uh, after that we have the drift correct drift compensation function so we can um w there i don't really think there's a reason that we turn it off because this function is so nice uh it corrects the uh sample drift um after each frame so um you it will guarantee you get the best result uh, you can so always turn it on and here you have two more options after acquisition you can blank the beam which i usually select because sometimes if you leave your um, beam on the sample for a while uh, your sample is going to be damaged or sometimes contaminated so i like to turn on the blank beam uh, this is closed column valves um, we usually don't need that all right so after we set that we can just click this button and now it's acquiring the uh, mapping for us so now in the acquisition window it only shows the images it's acquiring and this is the uh, the drift correction function is working uh, these are not very important for us for us what we are interested in is the actual um, elemental maps so here in this window it, it shows whatever uh, you select from here of course right now the elements are um, not correct but uh, before we come uh, we select the element i usually uh, would like to use this tool it's a spectrum integration rectangle to draw a box on the image so that we sh we can see the actual uh, spectrum so in the spectrum area uh, we can use auto id so that the software will decide what element the software thinks we have um, this function how to say sometimes it works uh, good and sometimes it just cannot identify the right element for you so it's kind of uh, like um, your choice to believe believe it or not and uh, but usually uh, you should be knowing very well what you have in your sample so instead of using the auto for auto id you can also select what select whatever you think um, there is like here i know i have carbon of course and i have a little bit of oxygen i have of course gold and I have palladium uh, so 
looks like this time the auto ID works out very well. The copper signal is from the the TM grid itself. That also tells you that it's very important that when you have uh, copper in your sample, you should avoid using the copper grid. Um, go ahead and get like gold, like moly, or even like carbon silicon grid. All right, so these elemental selections look okay. You can click this 2SI. It's going to overwrite the settings in, in the um, mapping over here. So right now, uh, you ha I have carbon, I have oxygen, I have palladium, I have gold. And again, this copper is from the copper grid. So you can just turn it off because we are not interested in that at all. So that's the um, mapping we are taking. It's, it's updating uh, after each frame. And uh, there are some settings for the maps. Like the, the most important thing I usually turn on is this post filtering. Um, if you turn it off, your map is just gonna be like this, uh, each pixel. But if you turn the post filtering on, it's gonna uh, just apply the averaging filter. So you can see the map more clearly. So things like that. Um, and you can choose what uh, which map to show on this uh, um, overlapping images and uh, you can also change the color like if you click this I'm gonna set the go to uh, kind of blue and uh, for example I'm gonna set the palladium to yellow uh, carbon to maybe red oxygen blue is okay so if we select all those panels now this is the the overlapping overlay images we are getting of course if for example we are not interested in carbon we can just take take it out and we can remove oxygen as well so right now we are getting signals I mean the maps only from gold and the palladium um, on our sample. And uh, whenever you think the the maps look good, you can go back to this acquisition and just click this button again. It will stop. Okay, so now it stopped, and this is the results we get. Um, and don't worry about saving because it's uh, saved automatically. So you can um, always export these individual panels by right clicking and select export all. And uh, you can define a folder like here, nanoparticles, select folder. And you can decide whether to export elemental labels and scale bars. And you can choose the format. There are PNG, JPEG, TIFF, and uh, click export. And the uh, same thing, you can export this window by right clicking and select export and export. So if we come to here, This is the images we just uh, exported from our EDS mapping. So this is um, straightforward enough. And in some cases, let's go back to the acquisition. Uh, in some cases, we don't need the full map. 
we just want to get a map from the selected area. Um, we can do this. We can use this tool to draw a box. And then the same thing, we set up the parameters and just click this button. So this time, it's going to scan only inside this box. And uh, in here, we are only, only getting uh, results, the x-ray signals from the selected um, box. Oh, and uh, one more thing. Here, um, you, you have four different choices to show the results. Uh, the default is the INT, it's the integrated intensities, and it's kind of uh, more like the very raw data. Um, and sometimes, because it doesn't count, it doesn't account the background and the peak overlapping, sometimes it can give you a misleading result. So I usually use this net intensities. So you see, when you click net, your um, your maps gonna change. This net, what it does is, it says uh, uh, the software will correct the background and uh, fit the peaks and try to do deconvolution if you have peak overlapping. So this net intensity is supposed to give you more precise results to show the elemental maps. And of course, if you want, you can switch to uh, like this weight percent, the atomic percent. Um, so again, I usually use net intensity for just general purpose. But if you like weight percent or atomic percent, you can just switch over. So um, it looks like the map is already um, decent. Oh, and if you want to check the uh, counts, come to the acquisition, uh, the counts are showing here. So right now we're getting about 1k per second, uh, one, 1k counts per second, and the dead time is around 1 to 2 percent. Um, if you want to get higher um, counts, uh, you can, let's come back to here, so you can either change the spot size or come to here, change this gun lens. Um, the FEI engineers recommend changing gun lens over changing the spot size. Uh, which I found is true because when you change the gun lens, um, most of your alignments remain. You just need to uh, fix a little bit um, misalignment. But when you change the spot size, a lot of things can change. So you have to go over the alignment procedures from the very beginning. And uh, on, on our SOP, Um, where is it? There is a table. There is a table uh, summarizing the beam current under different. Uh, yes, here, the the beam current under different gun lenses and uh, spot size. Um, so again, for for the. Um, for the, this fag register I am maintaining, uh, I am using spot 6 and uh, gun lens 4. So it will give you about uh, 260 um, pico amperes of screen time, a uh, screen current. Um, but I, I did see some users use like up to gun lens 2, spot 1, or stuff like that. Uh, which will give you very high, like eight nano, 
if you use spot one gun lens two, it give you eight point four nano amperes, and uh, in that way you can get a lot of counts here. But at the same time, you lose resolution. <clears throat> uh, and also, um, if you do that, keep an eye on the um, counts and the dead time over here. So generally, you don't want your dead time to be larger than, uh, say, 30-40%. Because um, if your dead time is over that, over 50% you are actually losing your data. You are spending too much time processing the data. Okay, so I think right now we can stop it and uh, come back to here, uh, right click. So um, if you select the in intensity, integration intensity right click it's gonna save the uh, save the files as int but if you want also net you click the net and export all it's gonna put the net net um, like um, at the end of your file name export because these three images won't get any um, any uh like net int stuff in the file name so it's gonna uh, ask you confirm overwrite i usually just just click yes and also you can save this overlaid image by exporting export so for this map we get this is the overlay um, and uh, this is the net intensity, uh, this is the uh, raw intensity, and this is the net intensity map. Okay, so um, that's the EDS mapping capability on our, uh, on our uh, Talos. So is there any questions? If you do have questions, uh, please post your questions in the in the chat uh, area. And uh, I'm happy to answer any questions related to the training today. still live okay so it looks like it looks like everybody is uh, pretty uh, quiet and I didn't get any questions from the chatting area um, I don't know whether it's a good thing or bad thing but uh, I think that's all I have uh, for the basic training for today. Um, oh, just uh, one more thing. If we need to, so uh, I just talked about saving images on the TEM side, on the FEI uh, side. Uh, remember, we on the uh, in the TIA we can just save the files as a uh, M. A EMI uh, which is going to be on the Z drive but on the GATAN on the GATAN if we have any images taken in the digital micrograph we can save the images as DM4 and we can save the images first 
in this RAID in this RAID drive. It's the local drive, so you can create your own folder here. For example, let's do a training, and uh, you give it a name like a u n p s and save so um, now your your images your image has been uh, saved your image has been saved in the local drive the raid x drive and uh, where's the training here so here and uh, also, uh, I wanna um, I wanna show you that this computer is connected to our email server as well. So, for example, you can copy. Say you are done with your experiment, you can copy your training folder over to the new email data. Um, you can use email new email data or new email data too. Okay, so under Talos, you can create your folder and uh, paste your result here. So now we have training. So later you can get your uh, images from uh, our remote server, the emo server. Uh, of course, you can use um, the USB drive. Um, you can borrow the USB sticks from our front desk and uh, transfer the data uh, over these computers to our uh, our public data analysis computers and then from the computers you can transfer the data to your like your own USB or your own like uh, cloud drive things like that um, so to summarize Today we um, we have uh, we have gone through the basic uh, basic operations in the TEM mode and STEM mode. Uh, by watching this video, you sh in later you should be able to know how to do the beam alignment in both TEM and STEM mode and uh, acquire the images as well as uh, diffraction patterns and uh, EDS mapping. Uh, the software we use today are um, TEM, um, like this Gaten digital micrograph, and uh, we have this TEM image and analysis and uh, we also have vlogs so um, our our file our result formats are going to be in three different formats and uh, we all have the offline software installed on our public uh, data analysis pc so on that pc you should be able to do post processing and uh, you should be able to convert the formats to like TIFF, like uh, JPEG, um, those common formats that you can uh, edit later with your own software. And uh, also just let you know that the Gaten digital micrograph is uh, free to um, the, the, the normal users. Uh, so you can just go to their website and download download the latest free version. Uh, with that version, you should be able to um, do the post processing on the DM4 or DM3 images uh, you take uh, in here. Um, actually, I have I have also written by myself a. Um, Python uh, application to convert uh, all those all those different types uh, into the common formats like TIFF, like PNG, JPEG. 
um, that software is running on the support PC. Um, unfortunately, the support PC is now not hooked up to this live stream um, format, live stream flat platform. Uh, so I cannot show you right now, but I'm sure in your second training, uh, I will be able to show you that. Uh, it's just very easy, it just takes a few clicks to convert those uh, files into the common um, data file. So, um, do we have any more questions? Um, if we don't have more questions, and let's uh, finish up. So, to finish up, say we are done with our experiment. Let's go back to the TM user interface. Let's go to the vacuum tab and close the column valve. So this is very important. Uh, as long as this column valve is closed, um, you usually won't uh, damage like the gun like RTEM um, significantly. So remember, you close this uh, column valve um, before you uh, do anything else to finish up the uh, your session. So column valve closed. Then let's go to the stage. So under the stage, you have this stage square, and you move it over to control. And here you have reset holder button. So click that to reset the stage. Okay, so right now the XYZ AB are all zero. And uh, Actually, let's uh, take a look at the section four, finishing up in the SOP. We just close the column valve and we uh, reset the stage. And uh, it also says you have to remove both objective aperture and selected area aperture. These are, you're not gonna need them in the stem mode, but as I showed you, you will need them in the TM mode. So remember when you're done, take them out like this. And uh, also uh, for for the ease of the next uh, user, you want to insert the screen by using R1. So here you see screen is inserted, but column valve is closed. And the next thing you want to unblank the beam because um, when, when, whenever you use, use uh, VLOX, the VLOX has the function to automatically blank your beam. Uh, but for the next user, uh, it's probably easier to unblank the beam so that the next, the next user can find the beam easily. So beam unblank button appears in two places. So first one is under the stem, stem imaging. So there's a blank button over here. Also, you can go to camera and uh, click this, uh, click this blank. So if you do that, this beam blank words uh, will disappear. So Remember, that's the status we want. We want the screen inserted, we want column valves closed, we want beam unblanked. <clears throat> and we already neutralized the stage. And uh, one more thing, we want to check if uh, the stem searching is still active. We want to stop any live searching here. And also, move over to Gaten. We want to make sure the one view is not viewing. 
sometimes uh, users leave this uh, one view viewing all the time it's uh, it's not good for the camera uh, because when you hit view the fast shutter is still working so we don't want that make sure you turn off the view over here and then we are ready to remove our uh, sample holder so let's go back to our loading so make sure you grab a clean uh, a pair of clean gloves and put them on Okay, so then let's go back, go to the microscope and click this on the touch panel, just click this remove sample. Alright, so it says reset stage successfully. Uh, then, uh, reason the GoPro is just um, freeze. Let's see if I can use this. Sorry, so for some reason my um, camera is uh, not working at this time. So um, you just remove the holder uh, as I just showed you um, in the beginning. So pull out and turn um, clockwise, take out. And then you want to remove the sample from the holder. Again, I will show you uh, the, the holder operations next time when you do the one-on-one -on -one training. And uh, after that, you want to insert the empty holder back to the TEM. So again, my camera is not working now. So you can go back to the very beginning of this, vi this video to review the procedures for holder insertion and retraction.
and uh, here now you you're seeing this uh, sam loading sample dialog uh, where you can set up the um, auto save pass and uh, I recommend after your your session you set it to um, the default Vlox auto save folder so that uh, other users will not save uh, results accidentally into your folder. Okay. So the folder insertion is going to take uh, three minutes to pump down. Uh, so we should wait for the um, airlock. So looks like my my camera is still not working, but I am waiting for the uh, pumping cycle. Okay, so the pumping cycle is done, and uh, you will just have to turn it counterclockwise and uh, insert it. So again, you, if you want, you can go back to the very beginning of this video to see that procedure again. <clears throat> so um, I guess that's all I have for today's training. Um, is there any more questions we have? And if we don't have more questions, and I'm going to uh, close this uh, live training. So again, um, I saw, I just saw some uh, names posted in the uh, live chat area. Uh, so I will, um, so after this training, I will give, uh, give you the daytime access. Uh, so is, if there is anybody else who has not posted your uh, name, in there please do so so that I can um, keep track of um, our user training history and update your um, your user profile and uh, for the first time trainees please make sure that after you get the daytime access you go ahead and book the session by yourself and uh, let me know
Okay, so looks like uh, I didn't see any uh, more questions in the live chat, so I'm going to close this uh, live streaming. So everybody, thank you so much for uh, joining this live training. And uh, again, uh, if you have more questions, please uh, feel free to send me an email or just uh, come over to my office and uh, and uh, just ask, just knock on my door and ask. So uh, thank you so much and uh, have a nice weekend. Goodbye.